from a small village in the northwest of England, Mary and Jasmik creates. Not for the sales, commissions or notoriety, but for the pure pleasure born out of her passion for textile art. You see, Marion spent 15 years of her life teaching others art textiles, and now, in her so-called retirement, Marion has grasped the opportunity to develop and produce her own work. And we are the lucky ones that get to marvel in her inventive mixed media masterpieces. Marion's work evolves organically, Akin to fungi, lichen and moss, she captures with her camera as the starting point for her work. She uses various heat treatments along with the inclusion of more unusual mixed media materials found in the home, including bath mats and scrubs, packaging, wires and a plethora of plastics. I get the feeling nothing is off limits as Marion enjoys the pure indulgence of experimental play. Following a successful solo exhibition at the Knitting and Stitching shows in 2019, Marion was approached by Batsford Books to write about her creative journeys. Lockdown provided the ideal opportunity to put words on paper and textures from nature in textile art was written and published in August 2021. The book highlights Marion's gathering of inspiration material, creating experimental and sample pieces, to creating final pieces of highly textured pieces of textile art. Marion is a member of the Prism Textile Group and we can't wait to share her and her inspiring artwork with you tonight. If you're joining us live, why not join in the conversation by leaving a comment or ask a question about Marion's work below. All the way from Bolton, Lancashire, please join me in welcoming textile artist Marion Jasmik. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Oh, good evening. <laughs> yes, good morning. Thank you very much for getting up early and having a chat with us, Marion. I'm so excited. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. You're very welcome. Well, you're not alone and we've got plenty of people watching, which is fantastic. And um, I'll put a few names up on the screen. So Vicky loves your work. Look at that. Love, love, love. <laughs> And the gorgeous Eva. Hi, both. Great. A great admirer of your work, Marion. So, Thank you. Yeah. I I get the feeling that reti has retirement turned out the way you thought it would be? <laughs> it has. It has. Yeah. It, it was it was always something in the in the future. So while I was teaching, it was always something to look forward to. And I know many people say retirement, it, it is a big change and you do have to adapt. But for me, it's it's Life has begun at retirement, so it's been a, a, a pure opportunity to do what I've always wanted to do. Yes, so it's been great. Well, you're an absolute inspiration um, oh. to a lot of people. Morning, Susan. Good, good evening. <laughs> <laughs> and Lisbeth, yeah, so lovely. Happy to see you live this weekend. Yes, we're happy to be here. Hi, Ches. Lovely to see you. <laughs> Look, lots of loves. I love all these loves. This is great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I must say from from retirement, you've it's been four, like six years, I believe. Yes. Yes. Four years it took you to do your first solo show. Yes. Solo show. And then you're approached at your first exhibition, you were approached by Batsford Books to write a book. You've done <laughs> commissions for Zara in their window display. I mean, there's no stopping you. <laughs> it's been absolutely unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. What a fantastic journey and one that I hope to continue. But, but yes, retirement um, has just brought so many exciting um, challenges and, uh, yes, it's been excellent, yeah. Yeah, and artists never really retire, do they? Never, never, no, no, no okay. never. There's always, uh, there's always something to do. And during lockdown, it was a life saver for many, many people to actually have something to occupy themselves and to challenge themselves. Yes, yeah, so. I agree. And you were busy writing a book during lockdown, is that yes. right? Yes. Um, personally speaking, it came just at the right time for me. Yeah, yeah the um, lockdown came about four weeks before, uh, just after I was uh, commissioned to write the book. 
So uh, obviously not being able to leave the home except just for an hour or so for a walk, which fitted in perfectly anyway. Uh, yes, I had the um, chance to, to actually, and the time to actually write the book. So uh, it worked really well, yes. But even though I was writing the book, I had to stitch. So yeah, uh -huh. some of the work that I actually stitched during lockdown is actually in the book. So I managed to get that in towards the end before, yeah, it was completely finished. So that, that was good as well. But no, I, I have to stitch. I, I, so I tend to stitch each day just for, even if it's just 30 minutes or up to about two hours. But usually in the early evening uh, during the day where my husband and I are out doing things, visiting places, going for walks, uh, going away for a few days. So stitching just, um, I have a work room at home, so that's quite nice. So I can just go in there just whenever I feel like and just have a play, just do little bits and bobs as and when I feel like it. So that's that's really good. It's been That's been a real bonus to have a, a work room now at home. Yeah, that's so beautiful to be able to have your own space. And um, we've got a little space behind our garage and um, we do we do nick down there on the weekend, but being in inside, it's mostly the kitchen table. <laughs> Yeah, the kitchen table's usually covered in something. Yeah, the nice thing about a workroom is you can close the door. <laughs> yeah, and still eat your dinner at the table. Yes, exactly, exactly. I can't remember the last time. We're always eating on our lap, but I'm like, why? We need to move the sewing machines off the table, but yeah, it's, it's good fun. I love it. I love that the, there's just a creativity in the home, wherever it is. It's, it's nice yeah. to have it around you. It is, um, yeah. 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 Well, your book's very popular. Um, Maura Summers loved it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank Eva, you. Ooh, we've just put a link up there. Sorry, the oh. comment jumped up. We put a link to the book there. Um, <laughs> yes, very inspi inspiring. Order it. You've been told. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Yes, Vicky, you need you need to get the book. Absolutely. So um, Lorna Crane's with us tonight. Hi, beautiful Lorna. <laughs> and hello, hello, Diane, and gorgeous Noni, who's um, my mother-in-law. Hi, Noni. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So tell me, were you ready for such a positive response to your work? Oh, goodness, was I ready? For so oh, that's, that's quite a difficult question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, in many ways, if I'm perfectly truthful, I stitch because I enjoy stitching and I enjoy the challenge and I enjoy the problem solving and I make for me and if somebody else likes it that's a real bonus um, so when I started to produce the work and started to get sort of positive feedback from people saying how much they, they'd like the work and then especially at, at the exhibition uh, it was quite humbling and quite overwhelming, actually, the response that I got from the exhibition. So that was that was um, yeah, that was that was a real positive confidence boosting experience. So yes, when you ask about a positive reaction, yes, it's 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 nice to know that other people like what I've done. Um, yeah. Yes. And, and I think that's so true for for most successful artists. They're doing what they love and yes. there must be an energy transfer into those pieces and into that artwork because it resonates with people. I think yes. that true love really resonates. So uh, Yes, and, and, and that's nice. And what I also find nice, with, uh, like at the exhibition, when you can actually speak to other artists, is their interpretation of your work. And that's nice. And this, this reminds me of, or this is what how I see it and which may be totally different from what I saw. And that's, that's mm. nice that um, my work is not a, a replication of nature. It's just my interpretation of it. And then other people see that and see it slightly different. That's good. It, that's, that's great. I enjoy that. Yeah. What have been some of the most memorable comments people have made? Do any stick in your mind? <laughs> uh, oh gosh. Mm, uh, memorable, uh, 
No, 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 no. 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 I, I, I just think that I, one of my favourite pieces, and I don't know what it reminds me of, but it fascinates me, is this little guy here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so for some reason, for some yeah. reason, like a memorable response for me, I can give you one maybe. I don't know. He just looks like some sort of little Rastafarian hippie. I don't know. He's yeah. Got, yeah. He's that, just that, cool. that, that particular piece was inspired by uh, some cacti photographs that I took when we, we went on holiday with some friends to, to South Africa and we happened to go into uh, a cacti, um, like a garden centre, but it was all cacti. Yeah. And so, of course, I took hundreds of photographs and that particular piece came from one of those photographs and it was actually made because um, I went to the our local fabric store and they were I tend to buy things that are in the remnant box or things that nobody else wants and this was an absolutely huge uh, bag of plastic transparent buttons and, uh, so, and I think there was about 50 pence for an absolutely huge bag. And um, this piece was made using those buttons and the fabric around the buttons. So each of those little section is a button and the back and the front is covered in dyed fabric. Uh, and that fabric is the fabric that you use to prevent weeds coming through in the in the garden oh, yes the weed mat yeah. yeah. and I actually picked up some of that fabric from the uh, some workmen who were doing some work nearby on one of our walks and I saw the fabric that had been discarded and I asked if I could take a piece and he said yes and I asked what it was and he said that's how they were using it um yeah. so when I got home I dyed it and then uh, yes covered the buttons and then that is uh, just black and um, a cream wire as well. Wow. That piece. But, yeah, I, I like that one as well. I just love the, the texture. Love, yeah, it's got such personality. I love it. Um, if you hadn't have said they were buttons with a plastic weed mat over the top, I would have said I would have thought that from from my eyes now I would have thought they were like felted little felted fabric of wool stuck together yeah. or something no. it's incredible but oh. the fabric once I dyed the fabric because I tend to use cold water dyes which as we all know don't really well don't work on synthetic fabrics They're meant for the natural fabrics but I don't always follow the rules so um I usually start off with a selection of fabrics, nets, organzas, uh, fabric that I've just spoken about, any fabric that I've got just lying around and um, sort of immerse it into uh, a cold water dye bath and then just leave all the fabric to dry, scrunched up. And so the synthetic fabrics, although the dye will run off and that's fine, but it does leave some marks in the creases where the fabric's dry. But then if you heat treat that fabric, say with a hot air gun, then the dye will concentrate and create quite exciting and unexpected results. And that's what happened with that particular fabric. So not only did the fabric melt and mm -hmm. produce like a, a quite a lacy effect, but the dye, as you can see, concentrated in different uh, degrees. And that's where you've got the different colour variations, which, again, was quite nice. It, it worked. Yeah, it certainly did. That's amazing. <laughs> what you. other sorts of dyes do you like to use? What other sort of colours? I don't. I, I use the cold water dyes. I keep them in, in huge coffee jars. And I know you're not meant to keep them for long, but I do. It doesn't matter. But yeah. I, I also use other colouring agents, uh, Sometimes I've even used shoe polish um, to sort of colour in some plastics or you could use, yeah, that would be an example. This this uh, small sculpture, what's well, quite light, it's about 30 centimetres diameter, that piece in actual fact. The, the fibres coming off are uh, monofilament fibres and I've got a big roll of this from, um, in England we have um, some scrap shops and I visit the scrap shop perhaps once or twice a year and the scrap shop sells 
um, products from manufacturing that would otherwise go to landfill. And I picked up a huge reel of this monofilament fibre, which is the equivalent of like a, a fishing line. So, And um, when I made this piece to colour in the top, I actually used some black shoe polish, <laughs> which yeah. worked really well. Yeah. Yes. So it's it's just looking around, really, and seeing what you've got in the home and what could perhaps work and have a play. It doesn't matter if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and just put it to one side and it'll, it'll be suitable for something else. Uh, it's, it's fine. The, if that actual piece also, the, um, the, the, the uh, centre of that piece, um, they are uh, flower head protectors. Um, yes. I, yeah, my daughter sent me a bouquet of flowers. My daughter lives in London some distance away and sent me a bouquet of flowers. And around the rose heads, they, we had these uh, flower head protectors, which were like little, um, uh, how can I describe them, like uh, tubes of like a, a plastic mesh. And it, um, I, full, I did actually just paint them with fabric paint and then folded them and uh, attached them to, to the base. So all of those are individual flower head protectors. <laughs> and inside those, yeah. um, my husband, um, well, obviously the, all the family know what I do and they, they're they always on the lookout for things that I might find interesting. He brought back from uh, the supermarket um some electrical uh, wire, uh, electrical tubing. Um, and I think electricians use it. Um, well, I'm not too sure what they use it for, but obviously onto wires and then you heat it and it actually shrinks. So inside that particular piece, inside each flower head, there's a cut piece of that that actually holds the, the monofilament. So I could heat treat it to try to hold the filaments in and they wow. were inserted in inside. So... Yeah, that was quite an interesting piece to do. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> We're going to get to more of your pieces because they're just fascinating. And I love how you describe how you make them. It's so exciting. Um, <laughs> and it's just so, un, yeah, unexpected. Um, yeah. But the wonderful Philip's asked a great question. He always asks great questions. Thank you, Philip. He asked, do fabrics co correlate to forms that you have in mind? as a project or do you experiment with a fabric to find the form? So what comes first, the fabric or the form? It's it's difficult really because I, th I think both answers are true. Sometimes um, I come across a fabric and I may just play with that fabric by heat treating it or dyeing it and then as a result of that little experiment, it may trigger an image of um, um a photograph that I've taken, I thought, oh, that just reminds me of. So then I may re-address that photograph and then the work may develop that way. Sometimes it's the photograph, and this is mainly the way it works, it's the, the actual photograph, and then I start to search around to think and to experiment with how I could interpret that photograph. So then I would look not just at one fabric, but I tend to... Um, combine lots of fabrics and then either dye them prior to combining them, usually with free machining or afterwards, and then heat treat them and take it that way. I may then manipulate them or I may then tear them apart and combine them with other fabrics. It all depends, but both ways work, yes. Both ways can work, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Philip. That was a great question. I've got... <laughs> um, I've got a, a sample here of some of your macro photography. If it, if yes. it loads, does it load up? There yeah. we go. Um, so that's that's beautiful. You can really see the inspiration there, the fungi and the seed head. and um, Yeah, the, the, the bottom of the little cacti, yes, and uh, tree bark is absolutely fascinating and the fungi, yes. Oh, yes, yes. yes. And then these are some of your sample pieces. Is this correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. Because the, the way that I work, um, a little, I, I don't use a sketchbook because I can't predict how my work is, is that what the end product's going to be. So I never, I never use a sketchbook. So my work literally evolves. Um, and in order for it to evolve, obviously you can't go from a photograph to a, a finished 
piece of work. Um, and my way, to, uh, my creative journey is to produce lots of um, samples. And the way this came about, I started to do little samples and just put them into a box as, as I did them until there came a time when the box got quite full. <laughs> and I yeah. thought, what, what am I going to do with all these? And then realised, actually, they were tiny little works of art in themselves. So I had a wonderful time prior to the exhibition in particular, actually taking each of those samples and developing it into, into a small piece of work. So each um, sample is really a different technique. And for me, they are my sketchbook and they're yeah. my reference material so that I can go back to them. I think, how did I do that? What did I use? Perhaps I could do. I'm always asking, what if? What if I did this? What if I did that? If I, I did the die now? If I, what, what if? And, and just have a play, just experiment. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. It's a piece of fabric. It doesn't, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. Just, yeah. Um, so the, the, the sample pieces, um, obviously now I've got quite a selection of those, uh, but each of those that you've just shown, show mm -hmm. different uh, techniques and different materials that I use. So, yeah, yeah, so that's, they're quite useful. They, they look great. And they, and I loved, actually, when I was doing some research for the interview, I, I happened upon the Arnold's Attic uh, YouTube <laughs> video that was posted from your exhibition. Yeah, from the um, exhibition. And, and the reason I mention that is that it's fantastic um, because you actually get a real sense of that that exhibition. This is a pe this is a photo of um, <laughs> I, yeah. that's a photo of that exhibition. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Great. Yeah, I thought yes. it was. Um, yes. But what I loved about that video as well is that you're talking over the top of this footage, but there were so many people within the stand, and they're all taking photos oh, and, they're, and they're just everybody. Look, you could feel the energy you could feel how popular yeah, it, it was um it was yeah. humbling it, i was yeah. absolutely overwhelmed with with the number of visitors that actually came to, to the gallery and yeah. i'm i'm not uh, an artist that's overly precious about the work so if you want to take a photograph take a photograph and yeah. i tried to answer as many questions as possible and it, it was made uh, lots of students came um and it was mainly how how have you yeah. done this? And, how, how, how? What, yeah. what is <laughs> what's the material that you've used? How have you created that effect? Um, yeah, so people were really interested in in the technique and how yeah. I go about it. Yes. Yeah. And going back to what you were saying about your sample pieces, is that that's a beautiful video to watch if you want to have a look at how Marion's actually displayed some of her sample pieces. They've oh. become pieces of art in themselves, haven't they? Yeah. You no, know, because you frame them up and they are on the wall, and you actually talk that's about awesome. them during that yeah. video, which I found very um, yeah. inspiring and helpful. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, I think at the exhibition there was over eighty of the small experimental pieces because I know we've seen a photograph of the gallery, but there was also an out, outside wall that was absolutely covered with all the um, the small sample pieces. Wow. So yeah, it yeah, it was it was good. Yeah. 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 We'll pop a link up um to that video so people can check out that video oh. as well and, and have a look. So Thank you. Yeah, yeah, if you haven't already seen it. It's got quite <laughs> quite a lot of views. Um, I wanted to ask you just quickly, Vicky um, made a comment about getting a, a stronger macro lens for the photography. When you're taking your photography, do you have a specialised lens or is it just a normal lens and you get up close? Right. Um, I have just a smartphone. So yeah. Just a, just a normal smartphone. Um, and um, originally I, I would just take photographs whilst out walking. I tend to take, say, um, it, it was some uh, lichen on a, a tree. I would take a photograph of the tree, move a little bit closer, take a, a, a close-up of the lichen, get as close as I can with the uh, smartphone camera. And then when I get home, download the um, images onto the computer, and then that would allow you to further expand the, the image uh, on the computer. Or you, you can actually do that um, on the actual phone. There are um, mm. uh, There is software that would allow you to do that. Um, 
I've since uh, on, I've since got a, a new phone, and that does actually have a, a macro uh, facility um, on there, which is one of the reasons that I that I purchased that particular phone. Yeah. But you can use it uh, just any any camera, and then um, just enlarge the the image. Obviously, um, some of if you if you take a, a digital camera, you can actually buy specialist macro lenses but it's not necessary not necessary yeah. at all i just use like like i've said a, 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 the camera phone yeah 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 fantastic that's good it's good to know that technology that's it's in your pocket you don't have to just yeah we don't have to no. invest in these big lenses. No. And most yeah. of us have most of us have our phones with us uh, most of the time so if you just see something it's easy just to ca capture that image and then I must yeah. say, I think perhaps now I've got I've got thousands of images, and writing the book that's what took the longest to actually sort out <laughs> fungi images, lichen images, trees, but whatever that took a long time. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a good exercise. So yeah, exactly. Uh, image storage is is uh, yeah, it's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't get me started. I'm terrible at that. <laughs> Yeah. Vicky says thank you so much. Um, okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. And Tara, Tara Axford says, I was one of those people in awe when I saw your work at Alexandra Palace. <laughs> oh, thank you, Tara. Thank you. Yeah. Glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. 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 I'm glad, Philip says, I'm glad to hear that you, you, that you use the question, what if? Um, do you ever take your finished works for a walk to find and photograph them in their original landscape? That's one of my favourite things to do, Philip, and I think we've got an example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there we are. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, obvious. Yes, I, yes, I have done. Um, I don't do it often, but uh, I have done, and uh, it's really pleasing to see, to see them like that in, in the actual inspirational landscape. Yeah. Um, Yes, I've got I have got a few, but I don't always do it. It is a good idea to to follow up. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I love I love seeing the textures in in nature and yeah, yeah. like it, you become an installation artist then. <laughs> <laughs> we just add another thing to your list. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> I absolutely love your vessels, and you mentioned when we were talking the other day that that was how you first. That was sort of your first series of work yeah. that you did. Yeah. Um, do you still continue? Like, is it important for you to work in a series? And I'd love to show your your fungi. Yeah, vessel. it is actually. I, it was only when I was thinking about about this interview, and I was thinking, well, why do I work in a series? Why? And I've realised now that it's actually a challenge because if I, I did um, a series of um, what I call fragments, which was um, a series of work from broken shells, and um, they were small sculptures, and you do the first one, but then the challenge is to yourself to do another one that's different, and then another one, and so the challenge then drives me forward and challenges me to actually think of different ways of interpreting them. So that I think that's what it is. It's like if you do, uh, I did a series on tree bark uh, during lockdown, and I did nine pieces of um, texture of, of the tree bark. And each, yeah, and those were the, yeah, those, those are the ones. So each one, you can do one, but then how can you interpret it in a different way? And then again, in a different way, and another one, and another one. And so that's that's the challenge. And I think that's what drives me forward, to, you know, to, to the creative problem solving of how to do these things. And then uh, those were three uh, final pieces of work that came came from those. And they're, they're over a metre uh, tall and about mm, I don't know about 10 centimeters in their actual uh, hemispheres they're actually going to be on exhibition with the prism exhibition shortly ah so, fantastic that's yeah. really cool. so the the one on the right hand side that's actually been made with cotton buds um you know the, oh, the, yes. yeah of of cotton buds yes. and free, free machine embroidery and it also incorporates some um, small plastic um, 
you know what they, they're used to cover screw heads we, we, if i found them in the garage they're actually like when you have a kitchen and and the doors are attached you sort of cover the screw heads with these little plastic covers and so i use the soldering iron to make a hole and they're also stitched in onto that one the one in the center is a uh, free machine work of uh, Oh, using, um, it was a strange fabric I picked up at the remnant shop, which was a, it's like a double-sided, um, in quite a heavyweight interfacing. It was on the top shelf and it was going yellow and obviously nobody wanted it. Um, but with that, I cut it into circles and then used the soldering iron to burn in the centre of each circle. Um, and that is overlaid on plastic straws. And um, the base of that one was, yeah, I think that, that was a free machine. Oh, yeah, I used a fabric um, that I quite like to use that's called Snow Sizel. And we can oh. get it from a, a craft shop. It's a very, very open laced fabric. Um, very difficult to explain. I think they make the fabric and then it's like dipped. It's almost like... It, uh, how can I describe? If you were to dip wire into paper making and, and bits of paper stick to the wire, it's that sort of effect. Yeah, so I dyed that, and that was the base for that one. Oh wow! And the other one was the it was the yeah the flower head protect, uh, protectors as well on that one. Um, obviously done in a slightly different way, and I think on that one, if I remember correctly, there may be some plastic domes that you put on um, to stop the doors banging. I found those in the garage as well that stop the do the, the kitchen doors uh, banging. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm always on the lookout for something different and something, yeah, that I can use. So do you, like, you have your, just to get the process, you have your, say, base fabric and then you either dye it or... or treated in some way or and then you, you start layering with that and then machine embroider over it and then you start adding extra elements and then you you do the melting and then do you no, create no. the form have I got it wrong? Yeah. Yeah. The, the the melting comes at each and every stage or can do. Yeah. yeah. So I tend to make my own fabric as the base fabric. So everything's done in layers. The thing about using heat treatment, so if you use um, the hot air gun, you can, you never know what's going to happen. You must always wear a mask for obviously yeah. safety reasons, um, but you never can predict what's going to happen. So if you um, heat, say, a lace fabric, you may find that some of the fibres will disappear and obviously you'll be left with like a skeletal form on other fabrics it may just crinkle and shrink so what I tend to do is to combine say three four even five fabrics either that I've dyed or I've not dyed some that I may some that I, whatever I tend to do free machine work on that and then he treat that and just see what happens and that then may prompt me to say, what if? What if I tear this up and then reassemble it with something else? What if I cut out and manipulate it? What if I now deconstruct it? What? So that would be like the first layer and then um, layers would build up. So some pieces could be three or four layers in total. So the components themselves may be heat treated as well. So um, I'm just trying to think of something off the top of the head. Um, so some of the plastics perhaps or whatever, they too could be heat treated before yeah. they're attached or applied. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, fantastic. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just, I it just happened. It's just I don't have a plan. And I, I remember writing in the book, um, I often don't know where I'm going, but I'm enjoying the journey. And that's exactly how it feels. It's not, I, I would hate to have to make something exactly like I've drawn. So I, I would never be able to do it. So yeah. the work evolves. It just, 
if I like it, I'll continue. And if I don't like it, I'll do something else with it or I'll try a different way. It's, it's play, it's experimental, it's enjoyment, it's having fun. It's just doing what I enjoy doing yeah. for the love yeah. of it. It's, and that's, and it, yeah, if it works, yeah. it works. And if it doesn't, and sometimes... Um, Sometimes I know if if I've like when you're doing a series, if I've done like mm-hmm. the first shell fragment, then I know that I'm going to do some more fragments. But sometimes, uh, like the, the vessel that that we that we just uh, had shown, um, I didn't know whether to do that as a wall piece or whether to do it as a vessel or whether to do it as a sort of molded three D sculpture. So sometimes that decision comes quite at, towards the end of the journey. It, yeah. And yeah, just, just depends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that. I'm just looking at some comments. I just want to make sure I'm covering right. everyone's <laughs> question. Um, Vicky says, um, so do the same thing over and over, but each is another iteration of that idea. Yes. That refers back to the tree bark, yeah. I think, that project. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I don't know. Did we go? Did, did, did we send a picture of the shells in? I can't remember whether we had them. I don't know. I don't remember but the green They're all shells. green. They're, they're, they're like small cream sculptures. I'm not too sure. Oh, whether. yes, you did. Here they are. Ah, oh, there we are. Yes. yes. So that's what I was saying. So um, the, so you make one uh, and then the the challenge is to, to, on the same theme, using the same um image which was an image of obviously fragmented shells to to then create the others in the but using different materials like the the one at the top there the 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 bits in the center at the top there that's um from material that is designed to go under rugs to stop them from slipping ah yes Uh, yes. yeah for, for that little bit and um there's lots of lots of different um fabrics and uh yeah on the 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 one on the bottom left um uh, that was some using some fabric uh that's actually used in her by her dresses to form buns and uh you know you so it's like a, a former uh and i i unraveled one of those and used that that's worked fabulously yeah yeah so all sorts of different different uh, techniques and different materials there. I love this series that you did as well. You're oh, what yeah. are these about, Marion? Well, I took a photograph of what I later, I didn't know what it was. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> it was interesting. It was interesting, yeah. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Uh, and when I got back, I, I had a look at it and tried to find out. And it, it turned out to be some slime mould um, and then I did a look a bit more research on the internet and uh, looked at other images of slime mold and decided that um, I would try to make some vessels. And all of these vessels are from um, that initial photograph and the, the research. The, the large one, though, that's uh, machine stitching on uh, plastic. We, I. It was, it was packaging from some bedding that we had and um, the plastic's really quite thick and so you can free machine that quite easily. Yeah. And uh, other sort of things that I've used, uh, the, the, uh, on the left-hand side at the top, that's the monofilament again. And uh, also the, the ones with the spikes, that's some uh, children's um, plastic tubing for making jewellery. Uh, oh yes yeah that i picked up at the store and with beads at the end the one below that is uh let me just remember that's a a fine layer of uh, normal polyester wadding that i cut into pieces and rolled around a piece of dowel like uh, and heated and so it held its shape and then i cut it into smaller sections the one next to that, the plastic on there is actually, again, from um, plastic stretchy hair bubbles that I cut and heat treated. Oh. Uh, <laughs> the one on the left-hand side at the bottom with the little black dots, 
you can't see very well from there but <coughs> excuse me uh, that one was actually made using um, a fabric tagging machine um I, yes i bought that off off the uh, internet and it's the it's the machine that they use in manufacturing obviously to hold the labels to garments. Oh, yes yes yeah. <coughs> and um, i've used that to, a, a number of times actually um, the one above that was just oh the one above that was um, uh, a plastic bath mat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, and um, also some some packaging, like a like a polystyrene packaging. I didn't heat that; uh, it was just cut into circles. But the plas and the plastic bath mat that was good. Yeah. Uh, are these I ones? Uh, sorry to interrupt. Are these yeah. ones? That are they coming? Are they the ones being shown in Rome? Yes, they are. Oh, they've, they've, right. they've just arrived in Rome, safe, safe and sound. Yeah, I just thought so, people might be able to see a little bit closer. These, ah, yes, make yes. sure they were the right ones. Yeah, yes, yes. yes. So those three of them. So, yes, so that exhibition um, is, as you can see, on the twenty sixth. So the, the the parcels arrive safe and sound. Uh, there's actually nine um, vessels in that collection, so oh. that will be interesting. Shame I won't be able to visit. Yes, that, that's a shame. You can't get over there or you're not allowed to go? Or... No, um, we, are we going down to London with the PRISM exhibition so there's a bit of a clash? Yeah. yeah. But it'll be nice to look at the images. I'm looking yeah. forward to that. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, so exciting. Yeah, Susan says they are quite ethereal despite their everyday mundane materials. Yeah, it's yeah. not... It's not the best thing to say it was inspired by slime mould, is it? <laughs> slime mould bathroom mat. Yes. It's not what you think of when you think of contemporary textile fibre art. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the nice thing. I love yeah, it, though. It's, it's nice to get textile art out there as, as a, equal to the other art forms. and that's I agree. What, that's what's yeah. pleasing. And uh, when I first started, I used to, well, I do, still do to an extent, sort of put pieces into open art exhibitions yeah. and just to get textile art in the exhibition and seeing that you know and to change the perception of it is is really important to me yeah I agree well done for doing that I think that's really important there's yeah I don't know whether it's because you know we're involved in it every day but um I do feel like it's becoming more and more mainstream like it's getting it you know Yes, exactly. That's good. Yes, that's good. I'm really glad to hear that from your side as well. Yeah. Um, Ali's asked, these textures are just amazing. Do you ever use the soluble fabric for your machine embroidery? Well, that is a really good question. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. But as we all know, it's it can be tricky and it's a bit of a faff having to then dry it and what sometimes I do. One of these uh, spheres, um, if we, perhaps we'll talk about it a little later, I use that technique, but I'm going to be really perfectly honestly and truthful now. I tend to use, and this is perhaps something people might want to try themselves, it's a lot easier and a lot quicker. I use the lightest um, interfacing that you can buy, the ultra light whatever i actually bought some from the fabric store but i was recently on holiday and we happened to be with some friends and we nipped into a diy store and they had it in the gardening section a huge reel of it and it was like 30 pence a meter and it was like four meters wide but it's the finest um interfacing type fabric that you can buy and i use that you have to use it in a frame to free machine but then if you free machine uh, on that fabric, you can then use the hot air gun and that will remove the interfacing and you just left with the embroidery. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my big, big tip. <laughs> that's it, amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's I, honestly, it, it, I mean, some people may not like it because it, it will leave um, a slight residue of of the fabric on on the uh, the stitching for me perfect but if you want pure just the thread then you would have to use the soluble uh, fabric but I have yeah. I do occasionally use that um, and I used it on one of the spheres because I then needed to mold 
the the shapes that I'd done on free machining. So um, yeah. I molded them over. Um, we are still lucky that we have our milk delivered in milk bottles. Yeah, you do. So, yeah, you still do. Oh, really? You still do. So, um, so in the village, the, the the milkman didn't get many milk bottles sent back for quite a while because. <laughs> I had a collection. So <laughs> I would do, the, I would do the free machining um, for the sphere and then uh, set them over the, the milk bottle top overnight, put some cling film over the milk bottle, put the embroidery over that, leave them overnight to dry, and then they were applied to the, the sphere. Wow. We're going to get to that sphere. I, I definitely want to see that. I just want to go ask a couple of questions while yeah, I'm sure. still um so ali says thanks so much brilliant she's gonna try it um <laughs> and and vicky says she's pretty sure that we call it frost net um right. maybe it's a different name maybe yeah. I, I would imagine so i think it is because it yeah. must be the fabric that you put over the obviously plants to protect them from frost so it, it, it seems logical yeah, yeah that it would be in the garden center but it's really really fine it's just like an ultra lightweight interfacing yeah fantastic but it's um, so quick and easy to do and uh yeah you don't have yeah. to all you don't have all the messing with the dissolving the the soluble fabric and all. yeah a couple of people have asked and, and i actually wanted to ask this question as well so i'm glad somebody else has thought of it <laughs> well. so eva has asked about your colors and you work in um a muted palette but sometimes lichens and berries they're so colorful mm -hmm. yes. like to that yeah one. So um, people have asked that question and yeah. i just find it difficult to work with color you do and my, i do i do yeah. and my i was i've always it's always been the texture and i think the color detracts from the texture so I quite yeah. like to work model I do have colors in there but again um they are very pastel and, and muted but um I just love working with that with that palette I find working with color distracting no it's mm. it's no I, I I I just I just love that and what it was one of the things that people coming into the gallery noted that it produces quite a restful atmosphere feeling about the work it was quite calming which was something and that's something you don't realize uh, until you actually get all your work together in in an exhibition and actually see it all on the walls and whatever you can you see you know and you get the full feel of it so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. My question was, I was going to say, my recycle bin doesn't look as beautiful as, like, what you know, <laughs> your plastics do. Yeah. My plastics are certainly... I don't know. I think I, think I must be wired slightly different. I, I can remember um, I was making our evening meal. We were having, oh, I think it was spaghetti bolognese or something, yeah. and I took the meat out of the uh, plastic <laughs> container and just rinsed it as we do, ready for recycling. Oh, I wonder what if? What if <laughs> I would use that? that? <laughs> yeah. So I washed it, dried it, and cut it into shapes and heated it. And wow, yeah, that was another one. But I, mu I must emphasize if you do anything like mm -hmm. that, you do need to obviously be sensible, work outside, use your full uh, respirator mask, you know, just to be. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I use that and uh, I, I, I've. I don't think I sent you the image, but I just recently completed another sphere that was made up of circles just cut from a, a plastic bottle that are all overlaid as well. And that was inspired by mould on a, a stone wall that I saw. Mm. In fact, there's three in that that series as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to so, get to your spheres. Just, oh. a, just <laughs> couple, a couple of last ones um, before we get to the spheres. Um so you never paint plastics? You don't have colourful plastics and then paint them? No. Okay, no. great. So that was a question from um, Marilyn. Thank you very much, Marilyn. So purposefully sourcing and looking for a muted colour palette. Yeah. yeah. And is the hot air gun that you use, is it like a commercial one or is it a heat gun or...? Yeah, it's just one that you can buy off, off the internet. I think uh, people use it to, to do like embossing on, on greetings cards. It's just uh, a, a craft hot air gun. 
Yes. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Tara. <laughs> um, and look, there's 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 a heat dis uh, there is a heat dissolvable oh. stabilizer as well in the ultra thin. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. I bet it's cool. a little bit more expensive though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah all right spheres let's find these spheres so that we can show now am i putting up the seed the three the, the one with the the three different size ones mm. not, not, um i've got this one yeah no not that one uh to this one? Nope, the other one is there another one yes that, that one ah okay talk yes yeah. about these yeah, so the, the, the one that I was re referring to is, is the one in the set, the, the one on the far left. Yes. Uh, that was the one that I did actually work on, on soluble fabric. So each one of those was free machine circle of strands, if that makes sense. And they were the ones that were left over the milk bottle to, to dry. Yeah. And the one at the forefront right at the front there um that uh, was made from each of those is a separate section and that was layered fabrics then they were free machined and then they were gently heated over a, a naked flame over a, a tea light which then burned away obviously uh, some of the uh, fabrics to various depths and that produced um, the uh, the texture there. And then you can perhaps just see there's some, obviously, wire in there and little metal washers from the DIY store as well. Oh, um, yes. Yeah. There. And the one at the back, it, these were basically made, um, it, this one was made from... Uh, large tri two triangles put together to make a pyramid if that oh, yeah. yeah they sort of folded and then fit over each other and so each of those um was then attached you can't see it on the properly but like in, in a group of five um yeah. and then the the wire was extended that's just a uh, florist wire there yeah. yeah yeah you've got such a great memory of like how how you you like you, you, you know what I mean? Like yeah. for someone who doesn't keep sketchbooks and you know what I mean, it's, it's, it's all there. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I just really would love to show people your fungi vessels. Um, now is that coming up? There we go. Yes, these are just beautiful. Look at the textures oh, and the layers on those. That you can, it's blossoming, isn't it? That fungi. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There were a couple of the first vessels. I do. I suppose part of my work is that I, I I have a strong feeling for texture, obviously, and and as we all know, when you go into the fabric shop, the first thing that you do is reach out and touch and feel the the texture of the fabric, as obviously as well as looking at the colour. Um, and I that that's perhaps was one of my driving forces that um, I didn't particularly want to make textiles that went under glass, mm. and I found that the vessels um, was a, a, a great way initially to do I still do do vessels but um was a great way to do that um these pieces um you can see the um the white pieces they've been heat treated again with the naked flame and just just burnt at, at the edges the to represent the the fungi and then the soldering iron was used with some of the white pieces behind and then um the the sort of hairy fabric there that was um, mm. oh, silk rods. Are you familiar? Yeah, silk rods that you can buy. And then, oh, yes, I have some yeah, of them. Yeah, so I just, yeah. if you strip off the, the slightest, you know, the lightest layer that you possibly can, and they were dyed and then applied. And the base fabric for that was, oh, wow, can't really. It, it, again, it, it would have been three or four fabrics, free machine together. Um, yeah, yeah. I can't, yeah, it was a while ago. And then the, the one towards the back, the, the, the grey, that's interfacing um, um, with holes made using the soldering iron. And the bits curling out, they're just um, pipe cleaners that I've burnt. <laughs> like, yes. 
<laughs> um, so they're just pipe cleaners with burnt sections and they're applied. And the white again was, um, I think it was a medium white sewing interface. See, the problem is I tend to get lots of fabrics, as I've said, from the remnant bin. So it's, it's hard to know exactly what it was and that's why yeah. it's hard to repeat um, yeah. Work. yeah um sometimes i can but sometimes if you've just got the piece yeah one piece of fabric that's it once it's used it's used it's gone yeah it's yeah gone. yeah we've got some questions so um susan asked how long does it take to make a piece roughly do you oh you well uh oh that's a difficult one in, in uh, 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 well it, it depends because obviously it depends how much work you're doing each yeah. day. So, um, so I would say perhaps one of those spheres would have taken about th three weeks. I would say perhaps doing a couple of hours a day, if that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so. Do you work on multiple pieces at a time, or are you just concentrating on one? I tend to. In my head, I'm working on more than one. Yeah. With my hands, I'm just making the one so while i'm ma <laughs> that makes perfect sense to me yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. while I'm, once i've worked out what i'm going to do and i'm in the actual making phase of making it and doing yeah. all the components and doing it my head is on the next project <laughs> so often yeah. i'll think oh i could just do this and so i might just break off and do one of the little samples just to see if 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 that works and then go back to what I was doing. So although I'm working on one piece, I'm actually planning the next journey, so to speak. But physically, I tend to work on just one piece. Yeah, yeah. At a time, yeah. Yeah. Actually, Ali asked a good question, and I, I, I'm a very tactile person. I love to touch things. Um, they, they seem very delicate, and do you allow people to touch them? as they are so gener generously textural. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. As long as people are, are careful. Um, it's a shame. I, I'm not that precious. I, I don't mind to share. And if people want to touch, as long as they're not silly about it, it's fine. It, yeah. yeah. It's fine. That's what it's about. It's enjoyment. And, yeah, it, yeah, it's fine. And in actual fact, they're far more robust than they actually look. Yes, being the being yeah. Yeah, 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 quite robust. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're very generous. Very. Generous. I don't mind. <laughs> um, I wish we could all touch them now, but we can't. <laughs> Have you ever used laser engraving technology in your works? No. Sounds no. good though. Would like to yeah. try it, but no. There you go. No, I haven't. Some, no. Something for the no. future. I toyed with the idea of a, a 3D printer. Yeah, I thought you might. As, as being something. I think it might go on the Christmas list, but we'll see. <laughs> That's exciting. That's very, very exciting. That would be quite good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Marion, we've almost been going for an hour, so oh, are you okay? That's fine. Yeah. I mean, are you okay? okay. To, would you like yeah. to talk about a few more of your yeah, fun okay. tactile okay. pieces? Because I, I think they're fascinating with the zips. And then I've got a few last questions. So if anyone's got some last questions, pop them in the um, chat now. Um, oh, Vicky Miller, when you come come visit me, I have a huge laser cutter. Wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. All right. You're invited to Australia in Vicky's house. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs> Vicky's great. I think, yeah, you guys would have a ball together. Um, oh, I wish she was in the UK. Yeah. Oh, visiting my, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Fantastic. It's going to be fantastic when the world opens up again. It's not too long it's, now. It's, yeah, for us. So we're going to show you, um, show everybody, should we start with the, the zipper? The zipper. Oh, the, the, the cat tie. Yeah, sure. Do you want to start there? Shall we, shall we it doesn't there? matter. Yeah, I love this little guy. How cool is yeah. he? <laughs> He's, yeah. Oh, it's obvious. I love, I love this one as well. It, it, this, this was a result of visiting the scrap shop and I uh, uh, bought a bag of white uh, zip length. It was like metres, metres long. It must have been 10 metres long. Uh, and I didn't really realise what I was going to do with it. But then when I was looking through my photographs of the cacti, 
uh, the thought came to me that perhaps they, these would work. So I dyed them and um, manipulated them, heat treated them. And so they actually sort of shrunk slightly and uh, created the form. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and then um, the the little white bits are um, pipe cleaners, I believe. It was something I picked up at the craft shop, but I've I heat treated the, the the tips of them so you can see that they they go down to the wire there. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that was uh, yeah, I, I love that one myself actually. I like mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pleased with that one. Is there something underneath that to give it form, or does yeah, it? It's actually made. I, I make um, a paper mache form first. Oh, so yeah. and the same for the the, the spheres. So they're actually um, attached to. Um, a, I, I do normal paper mache. You can actually do it over. Well, obviously anything, a ball or a balloon or or whatever. I did this over in fact i had i brought back from holiday once um a set of balls that all fit inside each other so i think i've got seven that are all um, the same shape yeah if, if you get the, the feel and then but different sizes so i did the paper mache over the the ball and then uh, to give the paper mache additional strength i usually cover it with a thin layer of uh, polyester wadding that I heat treat so it flattens it and that gives a nice base and then you, I can actually stitch through the paper um, ah, onto, and then when it's finished I put a base on so the excuse me the cacti could either go onto a, a plinth a table a shelf or they could actually be um, hung on the wall wow oh great so people would hang with the purpose of this well not purpose but people could could say purchase this and then pop it on their wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. yeah so, the, so the back is flat. It's, it's got a wooden base that's fabric covered um, with, with a tiny hole, so you, it would just literally fit onto the wall. Wow. Um, this, this one is made from... The circles are made from uh, another um, anti-slip rug fabric, but uh, they've been heat treated with the um, soldering iron to distress them and, and create the texture and change the colour. And then the wire has been stitched through and on the end of the wire is some mm, electrical tubing. Don't ask me, no idea. Yeah. It's just some, like it's Something. like a rubber tubing that's been attached yeah. to, to the ends. Yeah. I this, this is cute. Yeah, this, yeah, this one was made when I went to the fabric shop. They were selling off um, some um, curtain header tape because it had become discoloured. Uh, this is an actual transparent tape, so I, I presume it's used for net curtains or voils. And so I bought it and uh, it's just dyed with fabric paint and... Um, yeah, so I've made those shapes and um, stitched and uh, attached them again to another hemisphere. Yeah, they're so fantastic. I'm going to be greedy now. Can I just ask a couple more? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay, All right, I'm being greedy, guys. Sorry. Um, your um, these large round fungi. Uh -huh. Yeah, like let me try and guess. Are these paper straws and are they ear cleaners in the yes. middle? Yes, yeah. you've got it. Yes. Okay. yes. Oh, this should be. We could have had a guessing game. This would have been yeah, fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. The the paper um, straws and then the sections in between uh, is free machine work that um, uh, the interfacing that I've, I've then burnt away, and then yeah, they're the uh, cotton buds. Um, yeah. It's just the bud section that's been uh, inserted into the straws. That was quite. I, I made that one. Um, and originally it was all cream. It was the colour of, of the straws. But And it took hours because each of those straws is stitched on by hand. And then uh, when I got there uh, to the end, I didn't like it that much. I liked the texture, but it just didn't quite work. So it went into the sink and I actually dyed it at that stage with the straws as well. And I thought, oh, it's all just going to fall apart. But it And hung it out on the washing line. And so, so all, 
get all the dye came down. And I was like, yes, yes, that's exactly oh, what yes. I wanted. So then I added some uh, new straws for the fresh colours. And yep. the, the yeah, so I was really pleased. But sometimes mm. you just have to take a risk. And what's the worst? It's just a few straws and a piece of fabric, isn't it? But yeah, yeah you just have to take a risk. And if it works, it works. So yeah, I, was, yeah. I like that piece. Yeah, I love that one too. I, I love this whole series actually. The um yeah. the one's beautiful as well. Look at that. It looked just it reminds me of some delicate, gorgeous, sacred beach. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. one again was stitched onto polythene and that the the wire though is um some uh not telephone wire, bell wire. You know, if you've got a doorbell, it's the oh, wire. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that, that base, that base was made up of little um, circles of paper. Sometimes it put paper in there and mm -hmm. free machined and then some sections were um, burnt away and then oh. the others applied on top. So, I and, it, and, and there is a little colour in there. <laughs> yes, I, I think that's beautiful, very subtle. Does your husband have to lock his shed up? You're not yeah. allowed in there, are you? <laughs> What are you looking for now? <laughs> no, I need that. No, I'll get you some if you want some, but no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing oh. what you can find, though. But, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm just reading a few more um, comments. Wow, I really love this. Time to go through my recycled plastic collection I was using for sculptures at uni. Yes, Vicky, do that. And steal some of my husband's heat shrink. <laughs> yeah, everyone's going to be okay. <laughs> now. We've started a riot. <laughs> um, and Philip suggests try to reach out to GS UK Nottingham regarding laser engraving. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Philip. Now, when people um, order your book, what, what can they expect, Marianne? Is it, do you go into a lot of your techniques in the book and your philosophies around how you work? Like yeah. what can people expect? Right. The book is basically divided into two sections. So the first section talks about, and I explain totally how I do start with my primary observation, so my primary uh, inspiration, which is obviously the, the photographs. From the photographs, I then go on to uh, explain how I use the various techniques or how I layer the fabric, how I use the different heat treatments, such as the hot air gun, the soldering iron, the naked flame. I talk about all the different components that I've actually used and that can be used. And I try to prompt with lots of what if questions so people could think it through and think, well, what if I did this on my work? What, or what if I, you know, develop my work this way um, from there I then a little bit about about dyeing the fabrics and the technique of free machine embroidery because I tend just to use free machine embroidery and a couple of hand stitches mainly French knots and seeding uh, straight stitch um, and then two-thirds of the book um, go through my creative journeys taking the, the reader from the inspirational photographs that I took, the experimental pieces, and yeah, and then how I got to the final piece. But each one, I explain how I've done it. So for it, when we looked at the samples at the beginning of this, all the little yeah. samples, there's an explanation as to what they are and how they. Yes. So for instance. Um, the the, <laughs> the one in the center at the top the the greenish one that was made from a painting roller um that adds some expanded i don't know if you're familiar with that product that when you heat it it sort of um, puffs mm -hmm. out anyway so that was a, a painting roller that i've been using and i was just about to throw away and i yeah. thought well, that's really nice so that was cut up from from there the the one in the center is is again from the garden center and that is mesh that you put over uh, plants again i think just to protect it from from the birds eating the seeds yeah. and uh, again those are the tags from the uh, the tagging gun yeah. the one uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, those little circles were made from a length of ribbon that I bought at the fabric shop uh, that I painted just with some acrylic paint. 
and the synthetic fabric around them when you heat treated, all that buttled and the the, the white circles sort of puffed out. And that, yeah. that created a, a fabulous effect. Yeah. yeah, and then the one at the bottom was, um, I was having a play doing some uh, shibori where it, that polyester was heated uh, in a pan of boiling water to mm -hmm. create the shape. And then um, yeah. I used some paints just to paint um, the fabric. Yeah. Well, it sounds like your book is absolutely going to be amazing. And if it if it's anything like this interview, it's just going to be full, <laughs> full of generosity, tricks, yeah, techniques, process, yeah. All, all the good stuff. So um, it sounds wonderful. I'm definitely going to order a copy. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. I hope you enjoy it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. I just remembered we had a couple of videos of um, that we've loaded up of you actually doing some burning and doing some heat treating. Um, yeah. Let's play a couple. And um, you should be able to talk over the top, I'm pretty sure. Um, if not, okay. you can unmute yourself Um through the little mute button, but you should be able to. Okay. You'll have to unmute yourself, Marion, if you want to talk. Okay. Um, I hope you can hear me. This is um, making one of the shell fragments, as you can see. Uh, there's, I think there was three layers of fabric there that I've machine stitched. The, the center layer on that one was some gonna... sisal, it, you know, oh. the rope that yep. I, I teased apart and sandwiched in the center. The, 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 uh, the pyramid shape was something I picked up. It, I think it's, it's meant for putting rings on, on your dressing yes. table. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But <laughs> if you put the circle, the cutout over that, then it, it, it forms a, um, a ridge so when you heat treat it and then remove it it it, it retains that form if, yes if all that i'm gonna play it again i'm gonna play <laughs> it again and you can feel free to unmute yourself um straight okay. away if you want to talk more about it but i'll just play it one more time so people can really get a feel for it <laughs> edge i was thinking i might do something like that in in a large scale i'm working on uh, cross sections of tree stumps at the moment and i was thinking if i could find a, a nice workman that would let me use a, a road cone to do a big certain do them all different size yeah yeah <laughs> So you, just, you, don't need a, you, need a, you don't need a workman, you just need a naughty teenager to nick one for you. <laughs> <laughs> one idea leads to another. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I love that idea. Okay, I've got one more video to show and then I will let you go. I know oh, you've yeah, been fine. here for a while, but it's been so great chatting to you. Threads. So, what, uh, sorry, whether Marie. the warp or the weft threads are actually dissolving away to leave the skeletal effect, and and that's a nice thing. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. You don't know until you yeah. try it, and when you try it, then you, it may trigger something. Oh, that looks. It reminds. Me. <coughs> yeah. So, what what was that? Fa we couldn't hear you. Sorry, um, oh, during oh, the video, sorry, but I what, no what, idea. You don't. It's was it just, just fabric? Piece, just a piece of lace fabric that I picked yeah. up. Yeah. Give it yeah, a no idea. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Perhaps no. curtain fabric. I have no idea. I just yeah. tend to pick up bits that look interesting. Yeah. <laughs> One last question. A couple of last questions. Um, first of all, before we go, you're um, a, a member of the Prism Textile Group yes. and that's got an exhibition coming up as well. Yes. So anyone that's in, is it, it's in the UK? It, yes, it's in London. Yes, yes, at the Art Pavilion. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, and that's, I think it is on the twenty first. So some of the pieces in the book 
um, mm -hmm. will be um, at the exhibition. Yeah. Fantastic. So anyone lucky enough to be in London, please head down there. Um, yeah, in the next uh, couple of weeks. That's exciting. Yes. Um, and then there's also, if anyone's lucky enough to be in Rome, you can also <laughs> see Marion's work there as well, which is which is really exciting. Um, when it comes to your artwork, do you believe, and it, it's not a loaded question or anything like that, I just, I just, I'm interested to know, do you think that by being a teacher of art textiles it's made you a better artist and then vice versa to that, do you feel that being an artist, if you went back to ever teach, would it make you a better teacher? Uh, being an artist, uh, from the teaching point of view, I think you you would have to say yes because I think my my curiosity and my yeah. interest and my own personal creativity passes over to the to the pupils and I, I would like to think that I've managed to inspire the pupils to actually become creative and to develop their skills. Uh, the opposite way around uh, was it to being being a teacher helped me. So now, now, that, you, yeah. now that you've been an art professional artist. Obviously teaching is a two-way process isn't it? Yes. So I give, but you also get back. And so it's that interaction. And I think to, the, the way that uh, perhaps I approach it, the, the experimental way is the way that I taught. Yes. And, 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 and that's the way from teaching that I, um, I suppose, have developed how I now work. That I'm, I'm quite methodical and mm. quite, I, you know, I do this, then this, then that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a weird process, I would say. Yeah. That's gorgeous. <laughs> One you. last question from Anne. Um, how do you keep them from gathering dust and preserving them? Like, yeah, and thank you. Um, she said, Thanks, Anne. Uh, I don't do anything special. Um, uh, the, the pieces seem absolutely fine, but what you can do is if you, um, when you're hoovering with the vacuum cleaner, um, is to put um, a, a nylon stocking up just over the nozzle just so yes. you don't pull it and then just but it's never been a problem just no and yeah. people who have bought work um, from the exhibition absolutely fine it's 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 not a it's never been an issue yeah yeah I've got one last question. So everyone that's still watching, we've had such a great audience tonight. Thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in and um, making comments and asking your questions. It just makes this experience and the, the stress of going live so great when we get so many great engaged people. So I, I do thank everybody and, and um, I, I hope you've had a good time, Mary. Yeah. It's been great. Thank you. Yeah, so... <laughs> Pop your thank you notes in the comments and we'll um, certainly play them when we play our exit video. But I wanted to ask you, Marion, in regards to your textile work, what are you most proud of? Uh, and it's, uh, I, I think to date the exhibition, the, the solo exhibition, was something really very special um, and I suppose obviously followed by the book. But... Uh, Individual pieces, I haven't got um, anything that's that's totally. I suppose the the first the first sort of vessels that I did, uh, the the one that we saw in the landscape, that's a particularly special piece. Uh, I will that that's that was a, a yeah a special piece. That one, yeah, that was really the 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 lift off. So the, that one is is special to me. Yeah, yeah but. Uh, on, on the creative journey, which I hope is going to continue for a few more years, um, I, it would have to be the exhibition. I, I do, I did thoroughly enjoy that, and obviously, uh, the book is very, very exciting. And yeah, so we'll see what the future holds. <laughs> well, I for one can't wait to to follow along on the journey and and just enjoy <laughs> your work from from abroad. I think it's just absolutely gorgeous and. Yeah, if, if this is what retirement looks like, I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm going to play a video now and hang on the line. We'll say a quick goodbye afterwards. Okay. But thank you, Marion. It's just what a gem. What a gem you <laughs> are. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.